So hello you guys, welcome back to my channel. It is almost 1am and I'm trying very hard to be quiet even though I am absolutely hyped. Okay. I got to chat to the wonderful Dan Liu today who started off his career on The Walking Dead as an assistant editor, moved into directing, has gone on to work on incredible shows. Obviously, like there's The Walking Dead, but also he moved into um, World Beyond and Fear the Walking Dead, like Shadow and Bone. He's also worked in the Star Trek universe on Picard and Strange New Worlds. And I got to sit down and chat to him about his time with these shows, how he got into doing what he does. I, ju I love, I just, I love hearing the creative process. I don't know, there's something about it. With these interviews, I love doing them so much because I love film and TV. I love what I love. <laughs> it's an incredibly basic statement. But I love getting to hear how it was made. I want to hear the behind the scenes. I want to hear about the long days and the, the tips and tricks and the crazy stuff that people got up to in order to create these things. So getting to talk to Dan was an absolute dream. It's funny because like I still get nervous doing these. I, I've done I've done quite a few of these now and interviewing is something that I want to pursue properly. I, I love doing it. I just, I love, I'm such a loud talker. I talk all the time. I know that's what you know me for with the reactions. But I love listening to people and hearing their stories. And I just love sitting back. And when someone gets going and they start talking about something they love, there's nothing better than it. So yeah, this is my chat with the wonderful Dan Liu. Dan, thank you so much for agreeing to sit down and chat today. Um, it's awesome. It's awesome to get to talk to somebody who's been so invested and, and a part of the Walking Dead universe for so long. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but before all of that, you kind of have been behind the scenes in so many different ways. I mean, you know, assistant editors, directors, writers, that's that's very much behind the camera kind of work and they're very particular it's a very particular line of work so what made you want to get into doing what you do well i was in theater when i was young so i was always into drama and you know i was in musicals and i was uh, i played prince malcolm in macbeth and it was just something i always thought oh this is fun to do and yeah. in my high school they got an avid adrenaline grant back in the day when it wasn't that common so I was very excited to learn and start putting together video in the Avid, which ended up being kind of, all right, hold on one second. Sorry about that. No worries at all. No worries. <laughs> all right. So um, yeah, I got this Avid Adrenaline grant in my high school and there's this software. I'm like, oh, this is cool. You can put together video digitally really fast. Mm -hmm. And I just really got into editing. And um, I took that with me to when I went to UC Davis and I was just editing other students videos in exchange for computer parts so they could I could upgrade my computer and very smart um, very smart I turned all my group projects in my uh, university classes into short films and at some point my professors were like you should really consider film school and I was like what you mean like go to school to do this professionally is that even something that people can do and it just never crossed my mind that that's a lifestyle so um but I decided to try. So I applied to uh, two schools and I got into NYU. And so there you have it. I went to study film in New York, which led me to working as an assistant editor in my senior year for my professor, Sam Pollard, who's Spike Lee's editor. And we did this documentary when the levees broke um, about the Hurricane Katrina. So that was really eye opening, just seeing how creative editorial can be and how it contributes um, on the writing side of it as well. Because a lot of times in documentary land, you're filming and you have a structure and you interview people, but you just get a lot of footage. And it's really a post that the editors and directors can kind of guide it together into a cohesive story. So that's kind of where I started. Um, a British ad company, uh, Empire Design, hired me uh, a few years after that to start their Soho office. So I was a junior editor with them. And I always wanted to learn how to make those cool commercials and trailers um, mm -hmm. that we all watched. And three weeks in, there was a new pilot that we were up for, my company. So the boss was like, hey, um, you want to try to come up with a spot? Uh, take a look at this pilot. And it was a pilot called Breaking Bad. And, no fucking way. And AMC decided to choose my spot for the first teaser. They ever made a 15 second little commercial um and then from then I started getting 
all my spots each season made for Breaking Bad and I worked on Mad Men mm -hmm. campaigns and uh, they, you know, Empire gave me some uh, work in the UK as well. And I did worked on a couple of movies um, over there for their trailers. So it was very exciting for a time, but I eventually plateaued to a place where like, this is not why I went to film school. Mm -hmm. You know, I love telling people to watch these, but I actually just want to work on these. Mm -hmm. So um, they were like, well, you have to move to LA if you want to do post-production in the type of stuff we're advertising for. You know, I'm like, okay, well, as soon as we finish this campaign for season three of Breaking Bad, I will move to LA. And I moved to LA. Um, I knew one friend from university where I crashed on his couch for probably way too long. And, and uh, I stayed at my uncle's like two and a half hours away from here. Uh, well, not here because I'm not in LA, but uh, in LA. And uh, eventually after about six months, I met um, an editor who was working on a new show called The Walking Dead. And uh, we did a side project together and it we worked together really well. So he said, hey, um, don't know what you're up to next, but hang tight. If we get a season two, I want you to come on as my assistant editor. And that was kind of like the first lifeline, I guess, to this dream of breaking into the industry for scripted. Because, I mean, a lot of people don't know, but when you work anywhere in entertainment, they kind of categorize you into um, genres or uh, sections where if you do advertising, you're not going to get another job outside of advertising. Or if you do documentary work, you're going to stick to documentary work. So breaking out of that categorization is was quite hard. And so, you know, this was the break. And when we started season two, um, I worked really hard. I really wanted to just take on anything. My mentor, um, the editor, and he ended up being a director for the series as well, Julius Ramsey, he really uh, challenged me and gave me scenes to cut and mentored me about what makes good character moments. What is, uh, how do you feel more um, in each moment uh, for characters in these dialogue scenes? Um, and I learned a lot, you know, just really working hard and doing bad editing in the beginning and finally getting my big break in season four of getting my own episode to edit. So from then on, season five, I uh, became the full-time editor on The Walking Dead. And it was super lovely. I was uh, editing season six. I edited the premiere and we got to premiere at Madison Square Garden. So how wild was that? I mean, I remember I at New York Comic Con. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, such a thing. And it I don't think I've ever seen a premiere like that since. No. Um, <laughs> that was next level. I remember when they announced it was going to be at Madison Square Garden. <clears throat> Everyone was kind of like, oh, well, like, that's big. That That's pretty big. But then actually seeing it didn't norman write it on like a motorbike or something up he to did. The, so was... like yeah after we show the episode they had the stage set up and hardwick came and uh a lot of the cast you know even bernthal uh mm -hmm. came up to you know, participate and then norman rides up in a motorcycle i mean it was a lot of fun and i think the fans really dug it we dug it and it was just an exciting thing to be a part of at the time um and season seven uh i uh, I did. I still do a lot of side projects just for fun because I like creating and working. Um, I did a short film basically with sword fights and dancing. Uh, and I showed it to Scott Gimple thinking he would never see it because you sent him something and he's really busy. Maybe he'll see it, maybe he won't. Yeah. And a few months later, he's like, hey, I saw your short. Um, is this something you're interested in doing? Because I didn't express directorial interests um, before this. Uh, oh. And then I'm like, okay, I think I can do a pretty good job. And he had me shadow Michael Satrazimus that season, um, episode 14. And uh, it was really fun because I still had my editor responsibilities, but uh, they essentially had me build a machine at the production studio in Atlanta. So I could like, we, I mean, it wasn't Zoom back then, but I could work remotely with the producers while shadowing when I'm not working um, in prep and on set. So... It was a great. Oh, that's a great lot learning. to try and like stay in the zone with. <laughs> I mean, it's. I basically saw it as three weeks of the most intensive film school that you could ever have. Yeah. And, you know, um, Michael's done some of the best episodes of The Walking Dead. Uh, he did The Grove. That was like one of his big directorial debuts. And he's done, you know, he's became a producing director on Fear of the Walking Dead. 
So I learned a lot from him just in a short time. Uh, and the crew and cast were really lovely to me because they're like, oh, you're like actually shadowing. So that probably means you got to direct. And I'm like, yeah, I think they're like, is there anything we can do? I'm like, well, maybe I should make my own short film and produce it that will show AMC. I'm not just doing sword fighting, dancing musicals. And so <laughs> I um, came up with this little thriller, sci-fi, um, more Walking Dead-ish thing. Mm -hmm. And we shot it with some of my friends and cast um, and over hiatus. And season eight started and they sent me down to Atlanta to direct episode four. And so then season, then when I turned that in, the spinoff uh, Fear the Walking Dead called and asked me if they could borrow me to direct because I was still on a full-time editing schedule with Walking Dead. And so I thought, great, this is a lot of fun. I got to like edit and I'll just go off a month to direct here, a month to direct there. And that was kind of what I saw life was until the second year of doing that when I met some agent and managers and they were like, oh, you should really think about doing this full-time. <laughs> And luckily, you know, the Walking Dead family, they still, even though I said I would stop editing after season nine, um, they still employed me to direct. So I got to do uh, Fear and the World Beyond. But after that, I landed um, Shadow and Bone for Netflix. Uh, and that was a completely different style of thing. And mm -hmm. we shot in Europe and it was just a lot of fun, but it also opened a lot of doors. So after that, I did a couple of network shows and then I did this new show, Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which was uh, also, you know, growing up, uh, my mom would watch Star Trek The Next Generation. So it was pretty wild to be a part of this franchise that I've known forever. Um, and from there, I did more Strange New Worlds and Star Trek Picard and an Apple show called For All Mankind over the past two years. So yeah, and now that strikes over, I'm actually at um, Strange New Worlds now, spoilers behind me, so I have to keep it blurry. <laughs> I partially guessed. I partially guessed when you came on with the weird, foggy looking background. I was like, oh yeah, there's something going on back there. It's 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 crazy hearing that because you always hear whenever anybody is super into the arts, be that film, TV, music, whenever anyone actually makes a career out of it, nine times out of ten, it's a mixture of like hard work, college, like determination. There's a big chunk of it that is right place, right time, or just luck. You know, so you yeah. mentioning like that, oh, someone said I should do this. And then someone else said, hey, you should consider this or you shooting Gimple, um, your short film and him being like, hey, like, yeah, are you interested in that? It's it's just so fascinating to me. Um, but but with with what you do, I imagine that it would change how you look on things like you mentioned with, with Breaking Bad. I'm someone who I I loved Breaking Bad back in the day. Big time. Um, but like, you know, with, with working so closely with the show or like even with The Walking Dead, I guess, to an example as well, uh, to an extent, does it change how you view it? Because you're you're looking at it so much for work. Does it change how you well, view film and TV? I think for me to be a good editor, you have to have a very selective memory in that you can forget things, right? Because even when I'm when I used to edit and we would be editing scenes, I have to do my passive editing then I usually go and sit on the couch and force myself to forget the nitty gritty of it. And I try to watch it from like a fan's perspective or a viewer's, you know, I just try to enjoy it. And if I'm bumping on something or I'm not really enjoying it, besides the script, because I can't change that, but like <laughs> if it's rhythmically or something technical, then I'll go in and change it. And then I'll have to sit back again and try to forget everything again and yeah. watch it. And I think that's like a very important skill to acknowledge even if you can't always do it because um, otherwise things get stale and so I can do that now just with watching anything where I don't really think about it unless it's like absolutely terrible then you kind of pick at it but <laughs> for, for a lot of things you know I think it's it's fine like I'm really happy enjoying uh, watching a lot of these a lot of our modern shows in the new era um, post golden age television they yeah. would say it's interesting that you do have that disconnect because um, I, I've chatted to a few people. I got to talk to Aaron um, who worked on The Walking Dead and I was asking him like, because he does, he did um, special effects and editing and stuff like that. And I was asking him like, does it ruin it for you? And he was like, yes and no, kind of like your answer. 
Um, and I was chat. I got to chat to Cynthia, who did uh, the costuming on The Last of Us, and I asked the same question: like, does it does it take you out of it when when you're watching something and you might notice oh, that's not right or that should be different? And you also the same kind of thing that you can distance yourself and. Props to ye, because I don't think I could do that. If I knew things on such an intricate level, I think it would ruin film and TV for me. Um, well, on the other hand, like, it also makes you appreciate really great things, right? Because yeah. I remember, um, you know, working on all the shows I did as an editor, and suddenly this new show called The Crown came out. And you're just like, what is this gorgeous, gorgeous, well-done new Netflix show? You know, and it's just something that stood heads and shoulders above everything else surrounded at the time. And so I think it just really made me appreciate the craft of it, even without following the story. Yeah, I guess I could see that. I did. I loved The Crown as well. And I loved Bridgerton too, visually. Yes. Oh my God, visually, that is just stunning. But when it comes to um, directing an episode for you, that's I, I know that is a very long process and there's so many different steps. But roughly, how long does it take, like with The Walking Dead, for example, how long would it take from being told, well, first of all, how is it um, decided who directs what episode, like when do you get told, and roughly how long would it take for you to do your part, so before it goes to post? So usually a little before the season starts, maybe a few months before to half a year before, they'll start picking the directors of the season. And, you know, they'll usually bring back a lot of the directors they like. And with Walking Dead, because it was 16 episodes, they often had a few slots to either try new people or, like, try some recommendation. I remember um, uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan really liked a director called Rosemary Rodriguez, and she came in and killed it with the Carl, like, you know, crying um, in the sanctuary. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And then she became a mainstay director for many seasons after that. So, you know, um, they'll kind of find out, I'd say around between half a year to like the beginning of the season um, that they'd be directing. Then you get a script probably the day before you fly out. And then for Walking Dead, you get eight days of prep and eight days of filming. And that's one episode. Um, then you get to work with your editor for four days. And then you just have to say goodbye and let it go because, you know, in television, um, it's really the showrunners who have the final say in everything. So you kind of just do your best and present it how you think it should look. And depending on if they liked it or not, they'll keep a lot of what you did or work around it because oftentimes they won't reshoot what you did. Mm -hmm. um, but there's ways to, you know, as an editor, you know how to do things differently. Uh, so luckily, you know, repeat directors generally don't, get that because then they liked what you did so they'll keep a lot of what the work you put into it uh but again it's a tv is a very much writer's medium where after you direct you just have to let it go i mean i i i guess i knew it was a collaborative effort but so when it comes down to so if you were to direct an episode and you end up with you go a little bit over time so you get you got to cut scenes and there's, you know, like like on DVDs, you'd have the deleted scenes. That's always my favorite okay. part of any DVD or Blu-ray. I live for them. But like, so who gets to decide that? Who decides if you need to cut scenes or if you need to shave time off? Um, the showrunner. So, you know, if it's too long and you feel it's too long, you can often present scenes that could be cut. But ultimately, you don't get to make that final decision because it's the showrunner. They'll be like, oh, I like that. Yeah, we can cut that. Or he'll be like, no, we really need that scene because it's important to like something 10 episodes later that I, the director wasn't aware of. And so they'll keep that scene and then try to figure out how to cut something else. So if there's a scene that you really love and someone else decides we don't need it, it's just, it's just gone? Yep. That's how it goes. Oh, that's rough. <laughs> oh, that is rough. <clears throat> I wanted to touch on one of the episodes that uh, you directed because it has one of my favorite little moments in it. Um, I think it was in uh, was it Warning Signs. It's the one where you wake up and, and you're following Rick as he's kind of going out throughout the house. And just, just before okay. he leaves, he touches the little wooden plank that has Carl, Coral. I always say his name weird. <laughs> it has Coral and uh, Judith's little handprint on it. And that moment, it was so small, but so heartbreaking. And 
when I was researching for um, for this chat with you, it made me wonder, is there anything like stylistically that you like to include when you're directing an episode? Is there a moment like that that you're like, no, I really want this in like a, like a little flourish that you'd add? Well, I think a lot of directing for me is instinctive in that you read something and there's a certain way you see it, which is makes it different than how other people see it. And for me, it's about like, you know, really trying to get it the way I see it. Um, hopefully that's why they hired me. So, you know, you pitch it to everybody and that's what prep is for. You get all the departments ready. You're like, okay, he's going to touch it here. This is where we put it. This is where like the lighting hits and what happens when he clo opens and closes the door. Let's see that shadow. And so, you know, you get every department basically in, convince them that to do this and, uh, you work hard on set when you're shooting to get everyone to do it. So, <laughs> and sometimes it's very like improv, I would say in a way where if you're shooting, suddenly the actor gets an idea of doing something really cool um, that wasn't written. And then as a director, you have to be able to figure out how to present that um, if you think it's good, because often, especially on Walking Dead, so many things happen that out of the blue that you're like, wow, that was amazing. Um, but the hand thing was scripted and that was always uh, intended to happen. So, you know, we did that in prep uh, and Andy, every time he goes, it's a performance powerhouse. Yeah. So. Um, I, I, sorry, you said Andy and I just talked to the trailer, the trailer for the ones who lived just dropped yesterday. Oh, I can't wait to have them <laughs> back on our screens. Um, it's been a while, it's been a while. It feels like it's been forever. Yes. <laughs> um, but you spent so long, like in the Walking Dead, the main show, in the main Walking Dead universe that was skipping over to um to Fear and World Beyond. I mean, it's similar. It's the same universe, but tonally they are so different. I mean, World Beyond visually, so strikingly different to anything we've seen. And Fear kind of always had their own aesthetic that changed from season to season. So what was it like for you going into something that you kind of know, but at the same time is completely different? I mean, you always go in and talk to the team about what they're trying to achieve, right? And so with Fear, it was kind of fun because they really wanted to play jumping in time in that season to tell the story. So we really talked about kind of ways to transition in and out of the time jumps, as well as the colors and how drab the modern day is, especially since I was killing off Frank Delane, who's like what everyone thought he was the main character of Fear. So we really had to honor that and try to make it cinematic. And part of that was just me telling and working with my DP how to make every shot impactful and working with the actors. Although we didn't really have to do much with the actors when the, one of the main characters is getting killed. You kind of just, this is what's happening. Let's rehearse, but not really, okay, that camera's up. Let's do it. And, uh, you know, with World Beyond, it was really fun because season one shows... Um, same with Shadow and Bone and Stranger Worlds. You, as a director, you get a lot more creative um, input to be able to pitch uh, the way it could be. So World Beyond was my first experience of that, where we talked about what type of look uh, Matt was inspired by. And I think part of um, episode five is he was thinking Friday Night Lights. And so we we're more free with the camera than on Walking Dead, where Walking Dead, a lot of frames are very well composed and you let it play almost like a play, especially in the mid seasons. Um, and with World Beyond, it was very much like we were with the characters, we were handheld, um, we moved the camera um, by any kind of motivation the character gives us. So it felt like I had a lot of room to play and thankfully it got received well for, at least by the producers for what I did. So I felt justified in, those actions. I love that about the Walking Dead universe that you can, again, it is collaborative effort. It's everything put together, but you can really feel, I mean, when you have franchises, you always do kind of run the risk of just making carbon copies of each other with spinoffs. But mm -hmm. I feel like we never had that with the Walking Dead universe. Everything has been so strikingly different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially with, you know, Daryl even shooting in France, that feels like a completely different series. It, but with some um, Norman Reed so different. Everything about it. I mean, like, yeah, obviously we have a lot of new characters, but like even visually, it's so strikingly different. And like I said, the, the Once We Live trailer, even from yesterday, 
insane how different you can just through like visuals and through like you said I don't know the terminology but like through like the camera work and stuff how different you can make it feel so like you said that you worked on Star Trek now I don't want any spoilers I'm not ta not talking about the season you're working on I'm talking about in general because I'm a small bit behind so I have a Patreon where I do a whole bunch of reaction content and Star Trek is one of them because my patrons were like we really think you dig it and I had never seen it before and they were like we can't be having that you have to watch Star Trek so I'm currently just about to start next gen season three wow so I'm a good bit behind the general <laughs> like I'm aware uh but it's it's insane how a show that has been on in some way or you know running for such a long amount of time still has such a dedicated cult following it's kind of like Doctor Who in that way where it's it is like Doctor Who like yeah uh, and even Star Trek had a little bit of um, pause until it was rebooted in the 2010s with Discovery so in the same way that like Doctor Who you know it wasn't until they brought Chris Eccleston and uh, they had the new round of Doctors they had a break as well yeah um like I know you, you've, you've, you've mentioned shows and you've jumped from project to project, but I imagine taking on something like that is daunting. I mean, something that has a fan base of what, 30, 40 years more? <laughs> yeah, since yeah. the 60s. Yeah. I mean, even though it is new projects, I mean, like with Picard and Strange New Worlds, but still, what, what was it like going into that? And what, I want to know everything. First day on set, first memory from being a part <laughs> of it. What, what was it like? I think when I got the call to be a part of it after my interview i think i was more excited that i was branching out um mm -hmm. to try new things and i don't because it's a season one show i didn't think too much of what came before except that i watched a lot of what came before um, because the look that we go for nowadays you know everyone wants to make it a movie um especially for streaming shows yeah. so you always try to make the extra effort to make it look as cinematic as possible. Um, you try to have rehearsals and prep so that, you know, you're, we're trying, I think a lot of what we aspire to is to do it in a movie fashion where it's not like um, some of the old broadcast sitcoms where you go and you do it real quick and everyone has a great day and then you're done. We really want to push the envelope and with Strange New Worlds, it was, I remember reading that script and it was daunting in that it was very, very action packed in the submarine sort of way. But it was also, I was reading this and I'm like, this sounds really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so when I was meeting with the producers, they're like, you know, uh, don't mess this up. It's a season one show. And you're like, so, oh, no pressure. Okay. I like to do it. But at the same time, because of the, there's so much to do as a director in the day to day with meetings and with um, working with every department, you don't really have time to think about it. So it isn't even until now that I can reflect back on season one and I'm like, oh, yeah, we did this thing. It got received really well. We're working on season three now. I mean, that's wild. So, yeah, part of it is just you just put your head down and do the work and make it as good as you can make it first day on set which scene was that i remember um i was doing a walk and talk with uh two of our actors uh celia who plays ofura and talk about the pressure she must be under even though you know probably like me she can't think about it and you just gotta you go gotta but block it out to some extent yeah she plays like such an iconic character and she came from theater and i remember uh, she just won her grammy for a jagged little pill so i'm like this is so cool you're a grammy winner now <laughs> but because she came from the theater background and we were a season one show it, she just had so much fun exploring which is not something uh you can do as much on a later like we wouldn't do that on walking dead season 10 as much but we could do 12 13 takes of just like her walk and talk and different ways of smiling at the end of it right um, now you have to, as a director, you have to really know what angles this is going to play at, because if I'm going to spend 12 to 13 takes on this one, I'm not going to get like more than five takes on a different setup. So yeah, for make up for the time somewhere. Exactly. But I knew, you know, it would play in this one shot. So we just played with our character 
and we had Bruce who is um he's actually blind but he plays a blind alien so he also just was game to just keep walking and trying things and I remember that was the first day and it was so much fun that yeah I'm just like wow this is why we do it you know it's to try things try new things and um make cool stuff <laughs> and it's paying off you're making pretty cool shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, and then of course like being on the enterprise bridge for the first time that was pretty special because then you're like this is the this main is bridge it. Of the enterprise and there's our captain pike who is so charismatic um you know sitting on the captain's chair i mean i haven't even been with it that long and even i think i'd I'd get tingles, I'd freak out. I'd be in the corner by myself, like, yeah, I need a minute. Just give me a sec, I'll be fine. Um, well, with the card, um, I guess it's not really spoilers because it's all over the commercials, but I was a part of the last season and we brought back the entire cast, almost, of the next generation you're watching now. Yeah, I think I saw something about that. I think so I, saw, I tried to block it out because I was like, no, <laughs> but I did see something about that. Yeah, so in season three, you know, the storyline ultimately brings together all the old group and there was one shot in particular i was filming and we were behind the chair and i'll try not to spoil who it is but surrounding was this cast this legendary cast that my mom watched every weekend and i was just like wow this is what we got to do pretty cool that must have been really heavy <laughs> but like the, they're all such the projects that you've worked on, some of them, some of them are in the same vein, but like, I mean, Star Trek, in comparison to The Walking Dead, they are very different, very different um, projects and tones. So what draws you in? What draws you into a project initially? Well, I grew up reading sci-fi and fantasy. So, mm. you know, I've always liked stories set apart from our, what we know, but still relatable and on, on a human level. So my first book I ever read uh, was Ender's Game, first like sci-fi novel. And then I was re really much into the Dragonlance and Wheel of Time uh, books. So, you know, it's kind of these uh, worlds that are so foreign, but people with the same problems and how do they overcome it and how do they save the world and all this kind of fun stuff. Yeah. So that was, you know, what I loved reading and watching since I was 10. Uh, so now when we get these projects, I often find myself in the genre space because I just love it so much. So anytime like a new thing I hear about or my man managers or agents tell me about it, I'm like, yeah, let's get an interview. Let's do it. Sign me up. Yeah. I, I, I think those kind of genres as well, you're lucky in a way because there's always something new happening. There's always something new going on, especially sci-fi, fantasy kind of, I mean, yeah, Walker Dead, Walker Dead would be considered fantasy, although I probably don't. I wouldn't class it as that, but there's always new projects in those kind of universes. When it comes to being online or existing online, these projects have huge fandoms. Yeah. Hello, <laughs> I am one of them <laughs> from the Walking Dead fandom. It's so funny because, you know, we were so unaware of it in the early seasons of Walking Dead. Um, you know, in season two at Comic-Con, I remember all of us like uh, talking in the office like, did you hear there's like 6,000 people in line for Hall H and Comic-Con? And we were just all like shocked by, I mean, we knew the comics were popular. And even in season two, Kirkman had an office in the writer's room and, and the writer's room is right next to the editor's offices. So Kirkman would often bring a box like of toys for all of us. I mean, he was such a sweetheart, but um, it was a thing where we were completely unaware. And then season three happened and you're like, did you look at the numbers? Like a lot of people watch this show. And I think at, at season four or five, we hit our like number peak at 20 something million uh, viewers um, on cable, which is unheard of at the time. And I think yeah. only Game of Thrones matched it at the end, but in a different counting system because they don't count it like that. Um, so yeah, it was it was very much unaware for five seasons, just constantly surprised every year. And yeah, so we we're like, oh, our jobs, <laughs> make sure I mean, it stays uh, quality. Yeah, I mean, I guess back season two, season three, what we're looking at 2011, 2012. Yeah. I mean, I, Twitter, what, 
was around but wasn't as big as it is now or in the later yeah, years I mean I Twitter came out and I remember being able to follow in real time on the comments as the episode aired like that's impossible for popular stuff now because now it's just like floods of like comments that you can't even like There's follow so and, much. Yeah, okay but yeah at that time it was season two I remember I was like oh I could like watch as the comments pop up this is cool like they're talking about what we did that's what I was gonna ask you with like with the online side of things like do you like to tune into that and see what people are saying or do you try yeah, and pull I mean, yourself out of that a little bit I feel like I do like to because also you know I like I, with how I worked in editing I often try to put myself in the mindset of someone who enjoys watching this so it's kind of like I I know when people won't like something so I I'm always ready to brace myself for that <laughs> Um, but I don't really participate um, because I know how toxic it can get. So I'm much more of like just a lurker watching and seeing like how people respond. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's same for Star Trek and for All Mankind. We have some very passionate fans. Um, I love it when the scientists have equations for certain things the characters do and like why it would work and have a debate among themselves about why it wouldn't. Because on For All Mankind, we do have you know, astronaut consultants and engineering consultants for all of those. And there's reasonings behind why we do what we do. So it's just fun to me that people get a kick out of that and so much that they debate among themselves um, about that. And they do, they they just, they dissect things down to almost a science, like you said, in a way. It's, it's a hard question to ask and maybe it hasn't passed yet, but what so far has been your proud, either your proudest moment or your, you know, you kind of look around and you go like, shit, like, I'm here. I did this. I mean, that's kind of easy. Uh, my favorite moment of the job was season th season three of For All Mankind. We had this um, pivotal moment between when a president visits her ex-lover from 10 years ago, because every season happens uh, a decade. So mm -hmm. you have all this character weight, and she visits them at night. So we were shooting at like a 12 a.m. until 5 a.m. And it was these long pages of beautiful dialogue, just talking about, you know, trying to expose themselves to each other and trying to see where they're at after 10 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, coming from like a love of theater when I was young and learning how to work with actors throughout the years, it was kind of like a pivotal moment for me where like, it was so lovely working with them. And I'm like, oh, you know, I can do this because as an editor, um, especially early on my first two years I remember um, and uh, uh, they all know you as an editor because they all know you from the crew so it's hard sometimes to get actors to see you that you can work on this their same level because you know there's a vocabulary and there's a way of there's a method of working that's not what editors do it's only in the like grounds of like how actors work and how directors who know how to work with actors work so after my second year of directing on The Walking Dead I remember really wanting to improve myself in that. So I would take classes and I would read books and I would like practice with other actors. And by my final episode of Walking Dead, there was one moment I when um, Norman and Melissa were working at night, uh, we did a scene and I felt like I really actually helped give the right notes on an actor level. And so, you know, that's, uh, I, Action comes very naturally to me. I've did martial arts for 18 years. Um, editing is putting together the pieces and people ask me to do action all the time. So it's not something I'm proud of what I do for action, but it's almost like, of course it should be that way. And for a drama, it's something more like the unknown, sometimes magical. And it was that night on uh, Pam and Ellen scene on For All Mankind when you know we did just worked and did the dialogue and a very intimate talking scene where they were just sitting at a table talking, but it culminated and wrapped up a lot of the stories of their relationship that I'm very proud of. And I imagine those scenes as well, like you said, that they feel kind of smaller, more intimate, more magical. Those yeah. very dialogue heavy scenes do tend to suck you in in a different way than, like yeah. you said, an action scene would or a big blow up explosion scene would again this this is this is probably a difficult one for you to answer i'm just i'm throwing all the impossible questions at you um if you could have any sort any sort there, there's there's no rules 
if you could have any sort of dream team around you, who would it be? You, you, maybe you have worked with them before, maybe you haven't. Who would it be and why? Well, I think I have a couple of people in mind, but because I work with these people and other people, I think I don't want to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I don't want to pick me. be like working with someone and they're like, you didn't pick me. And I'm like, no, but I love you too. But it's not, you know, the industry is in a way where people often like repeating working with people uh, that they really love to work with. So you're often found in, even though I'm in very different projects, sometimes some crew members or will be like, oh yeah, you were in that, I was in that. I, I just want to touch on Shadow and Bone a little bit too, because I watched I watched Shadow and Bone and oh my God, I don't know. I don't know if it was the visuals, I don't know if it was the aesthetic, but I just, I loved that show. Getting into that again, yeah, it's so different to what you've done. But how did that even come to pass? Like, how did that come up on your radar? What made you want to go for? Because it? it is, it's completely well, it's still kind of fantasy, I suppose. So it's yeah, not completely it, different. But it's very different. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, you know, it was that was the time I was really looking to get my next job in Hollywood as a director, and to do that, I had to break out of the horror genre. And you know, my agents really pushed for me for hey, there's this new show. It's a big YA fantasy for Netflix. There's a huge book following. Here are the books. Um, uh, we can get you. Uh, we will try to push an interview um, if you're interested. I'm like, of course I'm interested. This is amazing. This is like epic, uh, I guess, steampunk Russian, kind of steampunky, um, 1800s. And I'm like, but not 1800s because, you know, fantasy. <laughs> but <laughs> it was uh, it was very exciting to even get a shot at this project. And so they sent me, this was at a really interesting point in Netflix's life where I think it was their like best time of creating because they often had creators write almost the entire season before they went to shoot it. And it was a season one show. So you got to be very creative as a director, but I they gave, they gave me the scripts that I would be up for. So I was reading these and I'm just like, this is amazing. And when I went to interview, it was like, you know, the production company, 21 Laps and the showrunner and Netflix, they were all in on the interview. Oh. And I would just, uh, I would basically pitch my heart out and talk about the scenes and how exciting it is and how I would shoot it and how I want to capture this moment and that moment. And um, I was working on, I, I went to Virginia to work on World Beyond after that. And it was while I was shooting uh, and it was lunchtime at the cafeteria. Uh, my agent and managers called me like, so when you're done with this, pack your bags because you're going to uh, Budapest. Oh my like, God. I, that's crazy. And, you know, I think, I, I don't know what went on with the producers for that, but I feel very lucky because when I looked at the other four directors around me, they were, you know, either legendary or massively like great credits, um, like our pilot director, Lee Tolan Krieger, had made like 12 out of 12 pilots at the time. And, uh, you know, he did the movie Age of Adeline and uh, Marizy and Jeremy, they all have amazing credits on multiple shows, Marvel, Netflix, and Jeremy, like Downton Abbey. And, you know, it was these like very experienced director. And here I am with my uh, three Walking Dead series. <laughs> Yeah, but that but, is a huge franchise. Come on, Mike. You're not be selling but you, yourself short. But you have to understand how Hollywood views it differently than the rest of the world, where every time, every interview I was in, it would be like, oh, you only did Walking Dead. Right. So it's very it's very different when I like go to Europe and talk to fans of Walk, Walking Dead or the South in uh, the USA. Um, but inside Hollywood, it's this like very small view of the producers where they don't really acknowledge how popular it is or the craft of it. Mm. Um, so it was very hard to break out of that. So I felt very lucky with Shadow and Bone. And um, and it was my first time fully experiencing what a season one show was like because I was second up, which meant I got to help pick out the location of the entire series. So we would, we I, I had the best tour of Budapest, I think anyone could have because we would be scouting every single castle and the, you know, the people would be, they want business. So they were like, oh, so this is the National Library. Do you want to see like the um, sectioned off area that tourists can't go to? Because if you want to shoot a oh, scene in there, you could. And we're like, oh, yeah, of course we might shoot a scene in there. <laughs> let's go ahead and have a look. Yeah, we'll consider it. 
So we got to go to like all the major halls, all the castles. And even, you know, we wanted to shoot the little palace as one place. So we finally found a castle two hours away um, that encompassed, had all the rooms necessary for scenes they would need, even if the ballroom wasn't as big for the next block. Um, but Marzi made it work really well. So uh, kudos to her. Um, and what we did was we basically, you know how like people have band camp or theater camp? Well, we had, it felt like that where we all went to live near that castle for two or three weeks as like a cast and crew. And we woke up in the mornings and went to the castle and they had our coffee ready and breakfast and everyone would like hang around the castle grounds. And then we would go to our locations to shoot it. I mean, it was, yeah, it was an experience. <laughs> that sounds absolutely magical. Yeah. I, I, I had no idea that um, if you were involved in the, like like for yourself, like you just said that if you were directing an episode, I had no idea that you had pull with where, where, where shooting would actually happen. Oh, so normally in television, the directors, they the first things they do when they go to prep is they scout. So that means you'll they'll have locations in mind for a scene where the production team will be like, okay, well, we think these locations might work for your scene. So then you'll visit like two or three locations um, sometimes one if it, what they had in mind was great uh, and then you would go shoot it but if they don't have any locations yet for a series then you have to um, help take them all out so you gotta go do all the tours and get to all see the all the, the back rooms, rooms. <laughs> um, and then also you know our stunt team for season one uh, is the stunt team uh, responsible for small stuff like Avengers Endgame John Wick Dr. never Spray. heard of them the yeah. most small indie <laughs> projects, never heard of them. <laughs> so, you know, the ideas they had were always so fun. And especially coming from my years of martial arts, we just loved hanging out and had a secondhand like talk for a lot of it. So like when Jesper was shooting his pistols inside the train, you know, it was very much like uh, we talked about it. They would train, I mean, train him with guns. He didn't need that much training. That guy is so talented. He like, they gave him the guns and he started spinning them right away. I'm just like, that's crazy. How young are you? <laughs> Yeah, and all the fight scenes, you know, it was it was just really fun to work with them. And uh, we had that that team was fantastic. It shows it shows on screen. It really does. Uh, I just want to touch very quickly on, um, like you said, your martial arts background, because I had no idea. And mm -hmm. like with stuff like you said, with Shadow and Bone, where there's such it, it's almost like I would imagine it's almost like having to choreograph a dance with such intricate moments. Do you ever? get involved in that especially coming from a background do you ever find yourself thinking that's not how it would be done or like you know I would do it this way yeah because I mean the wonderful thing about directing is you can get as involved in every department as you want to be so for me because we all like spoke in shorthand to each other I would uh, go over to their um, concept space and you know most stunt teams would have some space in either the studio or somewhere else where they would have boxes and mats laid out and they would come up with stuff and it was just fun for me. Or even when the actors are rehearsing, I'll just like walk over there and be like, hey, what's up? What are you guys up to? <laughs> and just insert myself over there. But it's accepted. So I'm OK. But yeah, we we talked a lot about certain concepts and they were very enthusiastic and they would show me like the inspiration for some of the hand gestures or moves or sometimes they're like, oh, and, you know, this one I feel like we should give to Jesse, um, you know, uh, Alina at for her to figure out a hand gesture because it's very emotional and not technical. I'm like, yeah, it sounds good. So, you know, we would work with all departments and the cast and come up with some fun stuff. And they trained them really like seriously on that show because the cast were required. I don't know if they were required, but they ended up going to the gym with our trainer three times a week and learned fight choreography. I mean, mm -hmm. it was a all kind of immersive sort of acting job that doesn't happen too often, I believe. One more question before I let you go, because I've kept you long enough. Um, regarding The Walking Dead or The Walking Dead universe, the main show, the spinoffs, there's so much history there. What is your personal favorite? Could be personal favorite that you've worked on regarding directing or maybe piece of editing that you're very proud of, or just your favorite moment from being on set or from being a part of it? It was my last episode I ever edited in my career. And, you know, this Which was, was? Uh, it was the uh, Heads on the Pike episode. Oh, my God. You edited that one? Yeah. So, you know, I made the decision 
months before this episode where I would stop editing, um, period. And so it was very like, okay, so this is the last episode I will edit professionally. Um, and thank goodness, like Laura Belsey did such a great job because, you know, I got to essentially end that part of my career on a very high note. Um, I remember seeing the footage. I'm like, this is beautiful. And I started editing it and making, working together, like, you know, putting it all together. And then Laura came in for her four days and she watched it and she started crying at the end. And she's like, there's, there was some things I wanted to try when I came in here, but I feel like I just can't touch that. And I'm like, you know, it's really good what you did. Like, let's just present this. And then when Angela came to watch it, she cried like through the whole last act. And she's also like, yeah, let's not, let's not really touch that. So, you know, it was just one of those things I'm really proud of. And it ended a phase of my life um, that was a huge part, like, you know, eight or nine years of, um, doing that so that's very memorable I'm very proud of it and it was one of my favorite moments as well as like such a sad and heartbreaking story for Carol and um, our characters yeah thank you for that that scene rocked my shit for weeks after I watched it the way that it was presented like there's certain moments of walk it history that you do remember like the lineup there, there, there's so uh, many I added the, the lineups both episodes too Okay, well, you need to talk about that now. Oh my <laughs> God, what was that like? What was it like shooting the? Didn't you guys shoot, um, a, a Lucille scene for everybody involved as well? Yeah, yeah. So you know, we we I made alts, um, just in case things leaked. So yeah. I made all, all that. Yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> but I think part of it was it was just hard to watch because we wanted to, you know, the the tricky thing is with Walking Dead they really wanted to do justice to the comics when they could. Mm -hmm. And graphically, they felt this was the time to stick to the comics. But work editing it for all day, every day, I really had to take breaks because I would be kind of sick. And I'm like, well, this is making me kind of sick. It'll make other people sick. But at the same time, the co cover of issue 100, isn't that the point? And, mm -hmm. you know, so it was... It was painful. It was, they shot seven cameras on seven people. So it was a lot of footage too. So, you know, I, when they came in, I'm like, guys, I need an extra week on this if you want me to do it justice because I need to watch every single camera, every single take. Okay. And you don't have that time in a normal editing schedule. And if you're going to shoot seven cameras, like, please give me another week, which they were very nice and did. So I could make myself sick for two weeks. <laughs> Everything about that is sickening. The sounds, the visuals, everything, the squelching of but the I think guts on the it's scene. not so much of like the disgust that or of this type of sickness. I think the sickness came from how sad we were. So I remember editing it and you know, I would basically Mag uh, Maggie, like Lauren Cohen always uh, it has such great expressions. I felt like I was almost emulating her expressions as I was watching it. Yeah. And so, you know, when, and even when I direct too, I'm still like that. I try to like put myself in the characters so much that when I'm watching the monitors as the scene is going on, I'm trying to like really be in their emotional state. So sometimes like they're like upset and I'm getting upset. And then, you know, it's just like, that's how I do things. So when I, when that one, I was just like, you know, I, and just like, just really like, all these negative emotions about it and sadness. And that's what was channeled into the final edit. Was it hard though, having to, I, I don't know how he, how he shot it or how he filmed it, but was it hard having to cut at the end of six and then come in then to the premiere? Like, did you, you did you film continuously? Did you film? Oh, they did not film continuously. So you did take a break. Yeah, we did take so was, a break. was it hard getting back into the groove of things in pretty much the exact same scene? I mean, props to them for connecting it. For me, I needed that break. <laughs> I don't think I could have done both back to back, you know. Yeah. Um, but they went and shot and connected. Um, you know, and that's something that every department, the costumes, the set uh, deck, the 
production designs and the actors themselves, the makeup, the hair, they have to bring it back to something four months ago. Yeah. That's not easy. Uh, longer because it was early in this. Or no, no, four months ago. Or two months. I, I think the break was two to four months, somewhere around there. So yeah, um, you know, they just had to, and they did. Um, and it was very upsetting and because now we were fully like the comics and yeah, for me, it was like getting inspired by the frame and rhythmically, it was just what felt right to me. Um, and, you know, Greg gave me these really cinematic and iconic shots. So we just did it. <laughs> that must've been a very stressful and heavy time dealing with those, particularly those two. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and Andy had such like grief. At one point, there was a debate if the snot bubble was too much. And oh, the snot bubble. Oh, yeah. But it was so real. It was. So I think, and at the end of the day, like if it can be as real as it can be, then Scott um, Gimple uh, sees that and wants it to be real. Um, so, you know, uh, it stayed. <laughs> I'm glad it did because like you said it just it helps you moments like that help you connect um but having worked on so many different projects do you think in the future that you would consider maybe moving to a big screen yeah absolutely I mean for me I just love making stuff so any opportunity I can have to do whatever you know I'll take a look and see um and uh with doing a movie obviously it's uh a little more creative control on the director side of things um so I would love that I mean I love collaborating on tv too so you know especially you appreciate it with the strike the past year it's like okay i just want to work yeah. so yeah um yeah and the bonus of working on great material i mean we're, we're very lucky that there's so much good content out there well i'm so happy that everything worked out for you and everything fell into place because you've been a part of some things that i've absolutely adored so i just want to say thank you so much for putting all the love and i know i know how hard it is well, I don't because I don't do it, but I could only imagine how hard it has been a part of these huge, huge productions with these with deadlines and stress and especially when you're creative as well. It's very hard to turn your mind off. With most jobs, you can kind of walk away to an extent and take a break. But with the creative jobs, it is it is a lot harder. So I just want to say thank you so much for all the love, blood, sweat and tears that you put into your projects. And yeah, thank you for sitting down, taking the time to chat. Anytime. Thanks for having me. And thanks for being part of The Walking Dead fandom when yeah from so early on I mean, it was pretty fun seeing all of you guys I didn't have a say in the matter once I started the show that was it for me it got me in its grip and I was like all right I'm in <laughs> I had an absolutely brilliant time listening to your stories and thank you for taking the time to sit down and talk all right thanks for having me and that is it you guys thank you so much for watching I hope you enjoyed it again Thank you to Dan for agreeing to sit down and talk to my crazy fucking head for an hour. That was an absolute wonderful night. I have to go and have dinner because it is 1am and I haven't had dinner yet. Oh boy. Am I going to feel that tomorrow? Hopefully we'll have some videos like this coming up for you guys in upcoming months. Um, not going to say nothing. We'll give no spoilers in case stuff doesn't come to pass. But yeah, like I said, this is something that I love doing and I want to pursue this style of video. So thank you for watching and I will talk to you all soon.